that's the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus did not happen, not, at least not bodily, okay? And during cross-examination, I want to ask you, what does it mean to actually have a personal power that's non-bodily? What in the heck does that mean? What, how can you have a power? Power is physical. Power is work over time. And, and that's material. We work, work is measured as a material thing. So how can you have a powerful being who's non-physical if power is measured in physical terms? How, what kind of sense does that make? Let me ask you some things about the resurrection of Jesus, according to the New Testament. What time did the women get to the tomb? Was the sun shining or was it dark? What do you think? Both. It was both. The, the Gospels contradict each other. The resurrection of Jesus, by the way, is a fascinating exercise because while most stories in the Bible are given once or twice, this is given at least five times. And you can compare them and you can see that they don't match. They're getting their story wrong. Uh, John said it was dark, but the others say, some of them say the sun was shining. Who were the women who arrived, who came to the tomb? There, was it one woman? Was it two women? Was it four women? Was it more than that? Different names are given by the different gospel writers. What was their purpose? Was it just to see the tomb, or was it to bring spices, or had this, the tomb already been spiced? Take your pick. These writers don't agree with each other. When the women arrived at the tomb, was the tomb open or was it closed? What do you think? Oh. Well, if you read Matthew, when they got there, this tomb was closed. And then... There was a great earthquake. By the way, no one else mentioned a great earthquake except Matthew. And that would have been an important historical event. An earthquake big enough to tear the temple in two, to open up the graves of Jerusalem, and all these zombies walked around and went back to their houses, and then a stone rolled away. That would have been chaos. It would have been mayhem. It would have been dead bodies and fallen houses, and yet these people are strolling around like nothing happened. But uh, when Matthew tells a story, the tomb was closed, and then it happened, and then the angel came. But in the others... The tomb had already been opened. The stories don't match in that. Uh, who was at the tomb when they arrived? Matthew said there was one angel. Mark said there was one young man. Luke said there were two men. John said there were two angels. If you put those reports on a graph of the decades in which they were written, by the way, uh, Mark was written around the year 70, Matthew and Luke around 80 and 85, and John sometime after the year 90, you see the growth of the legend. With Mark, you have one man, not even an angel. But with Matthew, you have uh, two men. And then with Luke, you have two angels. Uh, you have, um, I'm going to get it wrong here. With John, you have two angels. You can see the growth of legend. You see the footprint of how the story exaggerates over time. Where were the messengers situated? Matthew said the angel was sitting on the stone before it was opened. The, Mark said it was a young man sitting inside on the right. Luke said it was two men standing inside. John said there were two angels sitting on each end of the bed. The messages that these angels gave were four completely different messages. Matthew, in Matthew, the angel said, Jesus is not here, you're going to see him in Galilee. Go to Galilee, there you'll see him. Well, where did they first see Jesus? Where did the disciples first see Jesus? According to Matthew, it was in Galilee, which was 60 to 100 miles away. In those days, how long would it take them to get up there? Even on the fastest horse possible, it would have taken them half a day to get up there. And yet get back in time for the others to say that they saw him in Jerusalem for the first time time. Now some people say, well, you know, these different people can describe an auto accident from different perspectives and have different contradictory, which actually proves they were not colluding with each other. But if I told you that the accident happened in Sacramento, and Russell tells you, well, the accident happened, but it happened in Modesto. Does that make sense? There's two different stories here. These, these gospel writers don't get their story straight. I have about 12 more that I could read, but I don't have much time. But I'll just say, did the women tell what happened? Contradictory. When Mary returned from the tomb, did she know Jesus had been resurrected? Contradictory. When did Mary first see Jesus? Before or after returning to the disciples? Could Jesus be touched? After the women, to whom did Jesus first appear? Contradictory stories. Where did Jesus first appear to the disciples? Did the disciples believe the two men on the road to Emmaus? Yes or no? What happened at that first appearance? Different stories about what happened. Did Jesus stay on earth for a while? Some say no, some say about eight days. Others say in, in Acts, it was for 40 days. Where did the ascension take place? Matthew doesn't mention it. Mark said it was around Jerusalem. Luke said it was in Bethany. Um, and Acts said it was from the Mount of Olives. And we could go on and on and on. But I think one of the most damning things about the resurrection story is this data point that Russell mentions about the appearances. Before the Easter morning, Jesus is described in kind of normal narrative terms. They see him, they hear him, they follow him, they talk to him, and that kind of stuff. Just like you would be telling a story. But after Easter morning, everything changes. And now they're talking about 
he appeared unto them. Suppose you asked me if Russell was home, and I said, yeah, I went to Russell's house, and when I got to his house, he appeared unto me, and showed himself unto me, and then he disappeared. You know you're not talking about a real bodily resurrection. You're talking about a spook story. You're talking about the very same word appeared, ofthi, from that Greek particle from the word orao, which means uh, like a vision. The same word is used at the transfiguration when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to see uh, Moses and Elijah who appeared unto them. Does anyone think Moses and Elijah have empty tombs as well? It was obviously some kind of a spiritual thing. The earliest disciples did not believe in a bodily resurrection. The earliest accounts, especially Paul's account in, in the First Corinthians, uh, doesn't even mention uh, an empty tomb or even a tomb at all. He said he was buried at Tafi, he was put into the ground. So we see through that first century a growth from a very simple belief that, like grandma, Jesus died and went to heaven, and you know, we can pray that he's up in heaven now. That's probably what a lot of those followers of Jesus thought, that he had ascended spiritually to heaven. Later, that spiritual growth um, evolved, if we can use that word, into a bodily resurrection from people writing 60 years later, people who were probably third hand, weren't even first witnesses to the original accounts. And there's a lot more to be said about it, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not evidence, at least the bodily resurrection. If you believe he spiritually went up, well, that's different. But an empty tomb, the actual bodily resurrection of Jesus did not happen. And according to the Bible itself, which is already not a very reliable book, contradicting itself and coming up with the footprints of legendary embellishment, we see that it is not it's not even a strong data point. It is no data point at all. It is an article of faith. 